Parshas Yisro has 72 verses, and it has the most significant event in all of human history, and of course the most important event in the Torah, the Sinai experience, the miraculous prophetic experience where an entire nation is elevated to prophecy, and at Sinai they got the Ten Commandments. So one of the most significant portions in the Torah and the transcendental event that is at the foundation and bedrock of our religion. And this Parsha also has 17 mitzvos. And it's called Parsha's Yisro because the first event that we read about is Yisro or Jethro, who is the father-in-law of Moses, who we most recently had met when Moses, when he had escaped from Pharaoh, Pharaoh wanted to kill him. He traveled to Midian and married Jethro's daughter at Zipporah. And soon afterwards, Moshe went back to Egypt to save the Jewish people. Jethro remained in Midian. And our Parsha begins where Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, he heard everything that God did to the Jewish people. The news traveled all the way to Midian. And therefore, he decided to take his daughter Zipporah, the wife of Moses, and his two grandsons, the sons of Moses, Gershom and Eliezer, and travel with them to join the Jewish people at Sinai. What exactly did Jethro hear that made him make that decision? So we're told by Rashi that he heard about the miracles that God did to the Jewish people, the splitting of the sea, emitting water from Iraq, the miraculous war with Amalek, of course, the exodus from Egypt, and the descending of the manna. Those miracles were enough to motivate him and inspire him to leave his hometown and go join the Jewish people. Now, Rashi points out that he takes Zipporah with him, and that seems to be in conflict with what we read earlier when Moses was in Midian. He was traveling back to Egypt to go save the Jewish people after God told him to do that. At the burning bush, Moses went not alone, but he went with his wife and his children. So how come Zipporah, Moshe's wife, is still back in Midian when we earlier had thought that she had traveled with him to Egypt? So Rashi tells us that initially Zipporah came with Moses. They had traveled down or they had begun traveling down to Egypt. And then when Moses met Aaron at Sinai, when they rendezvoused at Sinai, Aaron saw his sister-in-law Zipporah and his two nephews, Gershom and Eliezer, and he said to Moses, what are you, crazy? We're going, we're going out to the land of Egypt, a place where the state of the Jewish people is at a terrible nadir, and you're bringing more people to join? And therefore, Moses sent his wife and his children back to Midian, and for the duration of the Exodus story, the Ten Plagues, and all the events that had happened in the interim, they were in privy, they were in Midian, and now they're coming and rejoining the Jewish people at Sinai a month and change after the Exodus. And we're also told here the rationale that Moses had when he named his children. The word Gershom is from the word Ger, which means a foreigner or a traveler or a sojourner. And when Moses named his elder son Gershom, the reason for that was because he said that I was a sojourner in a strange land. And the second son was Eliezer, which means God saved me. And the rationale for that is that God saved him from the sword of Pharaoh because Pharaoh wanted to kill him after Moses had killed the Egyptian. All the way back in chapter 2 of Exodus, Pharaoh found out. Pharaoh wanted to kill him and God saved Moses and allowed him to escape. And therefore... Moses invoked that miracle when he named his second son Eliezer. So Jethro, the father of Moses, came to Moses with his sons and his wife to the wilderness where he had encamped by the mountain of God. Rashi tells us that this is singing the praise of Jethro, that he was willing to leave the cozy confines of civilization and travel to the wilderness just because he wanted to join the Jewish people and wanted to partake in their miraculous connection to God. And he tells Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, have come to you with your wife and your two sons with you. So Moses hears that his father-in-law is coming and he goes out to greet him. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and he prostrated himself and he kissed him and they each inquired on the well-being of the other and they came to the tent. And then Moses told his father-in-law everything that Hashem had done to Pharaoh and Egypt 
for Israel's sake, all the travail that had befallen them along the way, and that Hashem had rescued them. So this is somewhat interesting here. Jethro heard about what had happened to the Jewish people and was inspired to come join them. And then he arrives, and after a reunion, a joyous reunion with his son-in-law, what does Moshe do? What does Moses do? So in verse 8 here, Moses goes into storyteller mode. He tells his father-in-law, again, all the things that had happened. Why does Moses do that? So Rashi tells us the reason why Moshe took out the time to tell him these stories was to draw at his heartstrings to bring him close to Torah. And this is, I think, interesting. Despite the fact that the reason why Yisro was even showing up here was because he heard those stories. And now Moshe is going into storyteller mode to tell him those same stories because even though he heard those stories, he's in here from Moses again, and that's going to be effective in tugging at his heart and making an impact, an indelible impact in his heart to make him embrace Torah. So what happens here? Moshe is telling the story, and Jethro is moved. Jethro rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done for Israel, that he had rescued it from the hand of Egypt. There's a very interesting Rashi in verse 9. Vayichad Yisro. Jethro was excited. Jethro had rejoiced. Rashi gives us two interpretations of what that means. Number one, that he was happy. That's a simple understanding. Jethro had rejoiced. He was happy. He was delighted. Then Rashi tells us something very interesting in the second interpretation. The word Vayichad means chidudim chidudim, meaning that Yisro had goosebumps. He had a twinge of sadness. He was sad over the destruction of Egypt. Yisro was not originally from Midian. He was originally Egyptian. And long story short, the Talmud tells us that when Pharaoh proposed harassing the Jewish people, Yisro objected. He was one of Pharaoh's advisors, and he had to leave the country to flee the country. But his pedigree, his background, his nationality was Egyptian. And now he's hearing all these detailed accounts of the downfall of Pharaoh and the humbling of Egypt. And he was joyous, yes, but Rashi tells us that he was also had twinges of sadness. He also had goosebumps and concludes Rashi, if you have a convert, you cannot embarrass their nation that they came from for 10 generations. The association that someone may have with their background, where, where they came from, their nationality, it's so embedded, even generations later, You still have to have a sensitivity around it. Don't cause them to feel sad. Don't embarrass their homeland because they still have an association and an affinity to them. And even though Yisro is joyous, there was a little element of sadness that he had. And he responds, Yisro does. Blessed is Hashem who has rescued you from the hand of Egypt and from the hand of Pharaoh who has rescued the people from under the hand of Egypt. Now I know, declares Jethro, that Hashem is greater than all the gods. This is now proof. I've been searching my whole life. Rashi tells us that Jethro was someone who had actually experimented with every single idol in the world. He was someone that was constantly on the lookout for truth. And now he says, now I know. Now, given what I've heard now, I'm in. I believe I'm totally committed to this way of life. It seems like Moshe's story, Moshe's storytelling tactic to draw Jethro closer had indeed worked. And therefore, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, took an elevation offering. He brings sacrifices to God and they have a whole feast. Aaron, the elders of Israel, all of them with the the father-in-law of Moses, Jethro. So this is how our parsha begins. It begins, the Jewish people are by the mountain of God. They're by Sinai. Yisro comes and they have this reunion. Moshe tells them a story. They have a meal. Fantastic. What happens the very next day? It was on the next day. Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. Moshe is the rabbi. He's the scholar. He's the teacher. He's the judge. And from morning to evening, he is judging the people. So it's a very important Rashi over here. Rashi asks the question, when did this happen? We know there's a great principle in Torah that the Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order. 
And therefore, even though the Sinai experience does not happen until chapter 20, until the end of the parasha, says Rashi, this event, the arrival of Jethro, actually happened after Sinai experience. The Jewish people were at Sinai for a year after the conveyance of the Ten Commandments and the Torah at Sinai. They were studying there. And during the duration of time where the Jewish people were in Sinai, after the Sinai experience, after the Ten Commandments, that's when Jethro arrived. More specifically, when did this particular event happen? The next day. That's the first day after Yom Kippur, which is several months after the Sinai experience, 40 days, Moses goes up, golden calf, Moshe destroys the tablets, all those events that happen all the way later on in chapter 32, 33, 34 of Exodus, all those events actually happened chronologically before chapter 18 of Exodus, before the arrival of Yisro. Which day is it when Moses is sitting and judging the people from morning to night and Yisro is going to observe and make several suggestions? Which day is that? That's the day after Yom Kippur. It's the very same day that Moses was instructing the Jews about assembling the materials needed to build the Mishkan, to build the tabernacle. And this is a very important point here, that for whatever reason, and we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, for whatever reason, the episode of Jethro, his arrival, his encounter with Moses, his suggestions that he gave to Moses that were indeed implemented, according to Rashi at least, that happened after Sinai, after the Sinai experience, yet it was preempted in the Torah for some reason. There's some reason why we need to be told this now, even before the Ten Commandments. And Rashi also tells us that when it says that the Moshe was judging the people from the morning until evening, it doesn't mean literally from the morning to evening, but it means that when a judge is judging the Jewish people with truth, with integrity, then it's considered as if they're a partner with God. And just like God created the world from evening to morning, when we read the beginning of Genesis, it says it was the evening, it was the morning. So too, when a judge judges honestly, they're a partner with God. Why does it have to be that when it says that Moses was judging the people from morning to evening, it's not literal? And the answer is because, as we know, on that day, meaning the day after Yom Kippur, the day when these events happened, Moses was involved with other things, not just judging the people, but also commanding them about the tabernacle. So what happens? Yisro is watching Moses, and Moses is judging the people, and he is perplexed by this. And he goes over to Moses and says, what are you doing? Why do you sit alone with all these people standing by you from morning until evening? So Moses responds, well, they want to be judged. They have questions. They have halachic uncertainties. And they come to me and I'll tell them what the law is, what are the decrees of God and his teachings. And the father of Moses responds, well, this is not, a, this is not efficient. You're going to get worn out. It doesn't scale for you to just one-on-one -on -one be the only person that people go to for answers to the questions. I have a solution. Heed my advice. I shall advise you. May God be with you. Go ask God if this is a good idea. Go select from the people, men of accomplishment, God-fearing men, men of truth, people who despise money. Yisro is outlining here the qualifications of judges, of lower judges, and you appoint them leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. Yisro comes in and says, okay, this is inefficient. Let's create a hierarchical system. Every 10 people have one leader. Simple questions you ask the leader of 10. Every 50 people, you have a slightly greater scholar who's a leader of 50 and then leaders of hundreds and leaders of thousands. And they're going to judge the people at all times. And the only questions that make it, so to speak, to the Supreme Court, to the highest court, to Moses, those are the more difficult questions. The minor matters, let the other people judge, the people, the leaders of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000, and the most difficult questions, only those questions come to you. You do this, it's going to work out. You'll have the wherewithal to endure, and it'll work out perfectly. So there's a few points here. Number one, we get the qualifications for a judge. 
It's men of strength, men of accomplishment, God-fearing men, men of truth, men who despise money. Interesting, we're told here that one of the reasons why someone could be a bad judge is if they are influenced and they are seduced by money. And here Rashi tells us that people that hate money, that means that they hate the money that they don't legally own. When the money belongs to someone else, they hate it. They want to get rid of it as soon as possible. It's not kosher money and they don't want it. Such people, those people who have that characteristic of integrity are people that are qualified to be judges. So Yisro is like the guy, the consultant that comes in and he's going to restructure the organization and it seems like his suggestion was accepted. Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did everything that he had said he chose men of accomplishment from among, among the people of Israel, appointed them heads of people, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. There's going to be 600 leaders of thousands, 6,000 leaders of hundreds, 12,000 leaders of fifty, and so on. So there's going to be many, many leaders and five different types of leaders, leaders of ten, leaders of fifty, leaders of hundreds, leaders of thousands, and of course, above them all is Moses, and only the most difficult questions actually arrive at the Supreme Court, so to speak, at the door of Moses. And the chapter ends with Jethro leaving. Moses Moses sends off his father-in-law, and he went to his land. He's going to come back the reason why he went to his land was because now he's been all inspired. He wants to reach out to the rest of his family and convert them as well, have them join the Jewish people like he did. So therefore, he's going to go recruit them and bring them back into the fold. Now, in chapter 19, the next chapter, we're going to read about the run-up, the preparation for the Sinai experience of chapter 20. But I want to kind of dwell a little bit on the question of the placement of of the Jethro narrative and his suggestion that was accepted, why is that placed over here? Like we said, Rashi, he is of the opinion that the story of Jethro, his arrival, his interaction with Moses, his suggestion, his consultation, that actually happened several months after the Sinai experience of chapter 20. The Ramban asks a fundamental question. He says, wait a minute, if Jethro arrives after the Sinai experience, then when Jethro is listing the miracles that he heard of that inspired him to come, why doesn't he mention the Sinai experience? That's the greatest miracle of them all. He talks about the splitting of the sea, the water from the rock, the war with Amalek, the Exodus, the manna. But if he actually arrived after the Sinai experience, isn't that the miracle of all miracles? And that should be the first one that he mentions. But regardless... There's at least, we know the opinion of Rashi and the opinion of the sages in the Talmud that Jethro indeed arrived afterwards, but there must have been a very good reason why the Torah altered the chronology and told us the story of Jethro beforehand. And this is also, specifically, we're talking about the Mount Sinai experience, the Ten Commandments, the most significant event of our history and of all of human history. God is going to speak to an entire nation. They're all going to survive the episode. And that is the bedrock of our religion. And this Parsha, this whole episode, we have to hear about Jethro. Jethro, in fact, is the name of the Parsha. Parsha is called Yisro after Jethro. And there must be something of this narrative, of this story, that is so critical to hear before Sinai. Before we read about Sinai, it's important to know this. What's that? What is the lesson of Jethro? So my grandfather of blessed memory, he would always talk about this idea. And he would tell us that, how does the Parsha begin? The Parsha begins with Jethro hearing something. Vayishma Yisro. Jethro heard something. He heard the miracles. He heard the Exodus. He heard something and that inspired him to act. Jethro was not the only person that heard it. Remember, Jethro is in Midian. If Jethro heard it, you would imagine Jethro's neighbor heard about it too. And maybe thousands, millions of people also were privy to the same information that Jethro had. What was special about Jethro is not what he knew, 
but what he did about what he knew, how he implemented that information into his behavior, into his actions, into his choices that he made. Jethro heard what happened to the Jewish people and he took action. He said, you know what? This is real. This is true. All the other pagan deities that I've worshipped in the past are false and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to translate this inspiration into action. He gets up, he packs up his family and they travel to join the Jewish people. Everyone else, maybe they had the same information. But the critical difference is, is that Jethro did something about it. Jethro took it to heart. No one else did. And therefore, maybe, argues my grandfather, we're about to read about the Torah, the giving of the Torah, the condensed version of Torah, which is the Ten Commandments. There's a very important lesson that we have to have beforehand in order for the Torah to be efficacious, in order for the Torah to actually change us in a material way, we have to first hear about Jethro. We have to first learn about what made Jethro special. And that is a necessary precursor to Sinai experience to the Ten Commandments. Someone could have the most incredible, transcendental experience that they could ever imagine. That could happen. But unless they're willing to take the Jethro quality and say, okay, what do I do about it? How do I implement it? How do I change my behavior as a result of that? The Torah is meaningless because it goes in one ear, out the other, and it doesn't last, it doesn't dwell. And therefore, before we get to Torah, before we get the Ten Commandments, before we get Sinai, learn about Yisra, what he did. That's the key to unlocking the power of Torah. So chapter 19 begins in the third month from the exodus of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. On this day, they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. The first month was Nisan. Second month is Iyar. This is the third month of Sivan. The first of the month, the Jewish people arrive in the wilderness of Sinai. They travel from Rephidim and they encamped opposite the mountain. And of course, six days later, is the momentous event of the Ten Commandments. And there's an important Rashi here. And again, everything we're going to read about in this chapter is going to be fundamental principles that are preconditions for Sinai and preconditions for Torah for us. Rashi tells us, by Yom Hazeh on this day, there's a few extra words here. It could have said they arrived at Sinai. We already got the date. The third month they arrived. What does it mean on this day? Says Rashi, the lesson from this is that Torah has to be new to us, as if we got it on this day. The Torah is the experience that we've been partaking from as a nation for thousands of years, 3,300 and change. Yet, here we're told, 19.1, that every day it has to be as if we got it today. Indeed, there is nothing new under the sun as Ecclesiastes testifies. However, with Torah, it could be new. In fact, every day it should be new because the Torah is coming from a different world. Under the sun, indeed, there's nothing new, but above the sun, from the spiritual world in which the Torah was previously harbored, the world of the spiritual, the world of God, the world from which Torah comes from, there there is newness. And every day we have to find the newness in Torah. And the Jewish people encamped at the mountain, and Rashi tells us, a very famous Rashi, ki ish echad belev echad, like one man with one purpose, with one heart. Another precondition for Torah is the fact that the Jewish people has to be united. We have to be like one person with one purpose. And the Midrash gives a very interesting illustration of this, that imagine you have a house that's built on two ships. The two ships are next to each other, and the house is built on top of those two. And so long as the ships are close to each other, the house is fine. But as soon as the ships separate, the house will collapse. Similarly, this house, this edifice of God revealing himself in the world via the Jewish people is only possible when we kind of hitch our ships together, when we're united in heart, in purpose, something like that, a nation like that, That creates 
the groundwork for Torah, for God's presence to be in the world. And therefore, when the Jewish people were united as one under the foot of the mountain, therefore they were capable of receiving the Torah. And some of the commentaries add that, yes, it's possible that there was unity earlier. In fact, our sages tell us that the Jewish people were united in prayer before the splitting of the sea. And therefore, what's so special about the unity at Sinai? Why couldn't they have gotten the Torah 43 days earlier at the splitting of the sea? They were united then as well. And maybe the answer is that when bullets are flying, it's no challenge to be united. When Pharaoh is pursuing, when there's danger, when there's imminent threat of destruction, then naturally there's going to be unity. However, what happens now? Pharaoh has been vanquished. There's no more enemies. Now it's difficult to have unity. Now the unity is earned. The Jewish people arrive at Mount Sinai. There's no more enemies, and yet they have unity. They're a people that is worthy of receiving the Torah. So Moshe ascends the mountain. God tells him, I want you to convey a message to the house of Jacob and relate it to the children of Israel. Rashi tells us the house of Jacob refers to the women and the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, refers to the men. And Rashi also tells us that God told Moses that the method in which he conveys the message to the men and the women is different. To the men, he speaks a little bit more harshly. The women, he speaks a little bit more softly. Uh, again, what this means is, the bottom line for us is that Moses is being evolved to speak in a way that works, that's effective, and therefore the audience, the recipients of the message, that matters, and you must tailor your speech to your audience. Well, what should you tell them? What should What's the message that God wants to convey to the Jewish people? You have seen what I did to Egypt, and that I have been born and that I have borne you on the wings of eagles and brought you to me. And now, if you hearken well to me and observe my covenant, you shall be to me the most beloved treasure of people, for mine is the entire world. You shall be to me a kingdom of ministers and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. What's the message that God wants to send? Two messages. Number one. See what happened. Let's look at the past. What, what did I do to Egypt? I took you out of Egypt on the wings of eagles. And now here's my proposal. If you listen to me, if you obey my covenant, if you keep the Torah, you will be mine. You'll be my beloved treasure of all peoples. You're going to be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the message. So there's a few points here to parse out. First of all, in verse 4, it says, you have seen what I did to Egypt. This is not some sort of tradition. At least the people that are hearing Moses' words, this is not some sort of tradition. These people, 50 days earlier, well, they were actually in Egypt. And therefore, this is not some sort of tradition that they have from their parents. This is not something that they have to believe on faith. These are people that experienced sensorily with their own eyes, with their own ears, with their own experiences, they themselves were privy to these miracles. They themselves were taken, so to speak, on the wings of eagles. And God, in an actual way, took them out of Egypt. This is an important thing, an important distinction. Our religion was based upon revelations, not revelations by a few people, not revelations based upon some tradition in the past, but a revelation that the people who accepted the religion themselves partook in that revelation. And in fact, the Kuzri, the great medieval work on Jewish philosophy, he highlights this point. When the king of the Khazars gathers the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians, and he asks the Jew, well, why do the Muslims and the Christians bring proofs from, from Genesis, whereas you bring proofs to the legitimacy of your religion from the Exodus and from Mount Sinai? And he answers is that there's a difference between the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews because our religion, our faith is based upon experiences that we ourselves have experienced with our own senses. And therefore, when does that happen? That happens at the Exodus and it happens at Sinai. God took us out of the land of Egypt like on the wings of eagles and he gave us this proposal. 
And the proposal is that God is offering us to be his chosen people, his chosen nation. This is the origin of the idea that we claim that we are God's chosen people. However, it's important to stress, if you read the text, it's quite clear that this is not something we got by right or that we got as a gift or that we got because of Abraham. This is something that we got because we chose. We chose to be the ones who accept God's dominion, who observe his covenant, and then we're going to become his most beloved treasure of all people, and we're going to be the kingdom of priests and the holy nation. We're the chosen people, provided, conditional upon us accepting the Torah and obeying its dicta. Now, it's important to stress that God has not yet offered to speak to the entire nation at Sinai. That's going to happen a little bit later. So what happens? Moses came, summoned the elders of the Jewish people, and he gives them this proposal, exactly as God commanded them to. And they respond, the entire people responded together, and they said, everything that Hashem has spoken, we shall do. We're totally in. So Moses again goes back to God and conveys that message. And then Rashi tells us that something happened here. They said, we actually desire more. We don't want to just hear the commandments of God through you. We don't want to just rely on the sensory experience of the miracles from the Exodus. We also want to hear from God directly, not via his messenger. And therefore, what does God say in verse 9? Hashem said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thickness of the cloud, so that the people will hear as I speak to you, and they will also believe in you forever. So this is the next stage. Previously, God says, okay, I'm going to give you the commandments. I'm going to give you the covenant. And as a result, you'll be my chosen people. Now he's saying there's something else here. I'm going to speak to you, Moses, so that the people will hear as I speak to you. The Jewish people are going to hear the prophecy that I'm going to give to you. They're going to tap into the phone conversation, so to speak, between me and you. They themselves are going to participate in the prophecy, and that is going to upgrade your status. They will also believe in you forever. So there's a little bit here to unpack here. The Rambam in chapter 8 and 9 of the laws of the foundations of the Torah are essentially based upon this verse, verse 9 of chapter 19 of Exodus. So let's kind of zoom out a little bit. There's going to be the Ten Commandments at Sinai. In Jewish parlance, that's going to be the conveyance of the Torah, the time where God gave us the Torah. That said, all we got were Ten Commandments. Ten mitzvot, if you will. There's still 603 out of the 613 to go. So what does it mean that we got all of Torah at Sinai. So there's a few answers to that question. So one answer is that, well, the Ten Commandments, yes, they're ten statements, ten commandments. It's not the whole thing, but it's a condensed version of them all. And therefore, it's like as if we got the entire Torah at Sinai, at the Revelation, at the Ten Commandments. The Rambam focuses on a different point. He says, the majority of Torah we're going to get from God via Moses. The method through which God is going to convey the Jewish people his covenant, his Torah that we need to hearken, it's going to be God tells Moses and then Moses tells the Jewish people. And therefore, what's the question? The question is, if Moses is a fraud, if Moses is a hoax, if Moses is not telling the truth about what he's getting from God, then how do we know that the Torah is indeed divine? Maybe Moses made up the whole story. Maybe Moses was an illegitimate prophet. Maybe Moses was able to just convince us, delude us into believing that he is privy to regular, ongoing prophecy from God. How do we know he's legit? And really, all of Torah hinges on this one question. If Moses is a fraud, then the whole Torah is a fraud too, because the Torah is going to be given to us via Moses. That's what we're going to discover at Sinai, says the Rambam. That's what it means over here. Hashem said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thickness of the cloud, so so that the people will hear as I speak to you, 
and they will also believe in you forever. Moses is going to be conveying to us the body of the Torah. Sinai is significant, not about the information that we're going to learn at Sinai, but rather the way that that information is going to be conveyed. It's going to be a prophecy from God to Moses, but a prophecy, the one exception, where we could hear, we could partake in it. And therefore, the entire nation is going to be experiencing prophecy together with Moses at Sinai. And therefore, what happens next day later, or a month later, or a year later, or 3,000 years later? The question could be asked. When Moses gave us all kinds of mitzvahs, not the ones at Sinai, how do we know that he's a real prophet? How do we know that he's legit? Maybe he's making it up. And therefore, all of Torah is just Moses' word. Who says he's a real prophet? You know who says he's a real prophet? The Sinai experience. The Sinai experience is a verification where an entire nation verified independently the legitimacy, veracity of Moses' prophecy. And therefore, all of Torah, which is going to be given to us via Moses, all of Torah we know in detail from God because we proved by ourselves experiencing prophecy alongside Moses that Moses is a legitimate prophet and therefore his word we know we could trust comes indeed from God. And in fact, the Ram continues in explaining that, therefore, the level of verification of Moses' prophecy is greater than any other prophet, because no other prophet was vetted in this way that the entire nation experienced prophecy alongside him. All the other prophets, they were vetted only via miracles that they did. And therefore, unless someone is on the same level of Moses, Unless they too had their prophecy vetted by the entire nation, they're not able to supplant Moses because Moses is a higher prophet. And that's the idea of the 13 principles of faith where we read that Moses is the father of all prophets. He is the one who is towering above all the other prophets and we only believe the legitimacy of other prophets because Moses told us about them. So for example, Abraham's a prophet. How do we know? The answer is we know because Moses, who was verified, told us that he, Abraham meaning, is indeed a prophet. So according to this, the actual Torah that we got, so to speak, at Sinai, of course, there's the Ten Commandments. But what we really got out of it, the lasting impact was the fact that now we know for the rest of Torah, for the rest of the books of the Torah, the words of Moses come directly from God. Okay, so now that the Jewish people are going to have this prophecy, they're going to need to prepare. They're going to need to sanctify themselves today and tomorrow. They have to wash their clothing. They have to separate from their wives. God is going to descend on the mountain in front of the entire people. And because this is a much higher experience, they have to be very careful not to ascend the mountain, not to touch the mountain. If they touch the mountain, they indeed will die. And therefore, God tells Moses, go warn the Jewish people to be very careful because this experience is going to be unlike anything ever experienced by any human prior to that in history. A hand shall not touch the mountain, for he shall surely be stoned or thrown down, whether animal or person, he shall not live. Upon the extended blast of the shofar, they may ascend the mountain. There's going to be a period where the mountain is going to be electric, so to speak. The presence of God is going to descend upon the mountain, and therefore, humans cannot get too close. If they do get close, they're going to be zapped and they're going to die. Until there is the blowing of the shofar, until that is going to signal the departure of the divine presence, no one's allowed to touch the mountain. So it's interesting here. Rashi tells us that there's going to be this shofar blast that's going to signal the end of God's presence on the mountain. And until that shofar is blasted, no one could touch the mountain. Where does that shofar come from? Rashi tells us something really interesting, that that shofar comes from the horn of the ram that we met in Genesis. In Genesis, Abraham is going to sacrifice his son Isaac. And long story short, Isaac is spared and a ram that was entangled in the thorns, in the thicket, in its horns, that ram was supplanted. That same ram's horn is going to be blown, says Rashi, signaling the end of God's presence on the mountain. 
And the Ramban asks a really interesting question. He says, wait a minute, the ram of Isaac, well, that was sacrificed. And not just the body of the animal, every part of the animal was burned. And therefore, that horn, that chauffeur of the ram is long gone. It was made into dust. What happened to it? How could we blow that same shofar once again? And the Ramban suggests something really interesting. Maybe God gathered the dust of the horn and reconstituted it, and that's going to be the horn that's going to be blown to signal the end of God's presence on the mountain. Interesting idea. Okay, so Moses goes back to the Jewish people and tells them, time to prepare, separate from your wives from three days, wash your clothing, in three days, we're going to have this most amazing experience. And on the third day, it was the morning. There was thunder and lightning and a heavy cloud on the mountain. The sound of the shofar was very powerful. This is not the shofar that signals the end, but the sound of the experiences of the Sinai. And the entire people that was in the camp shuddered. Okay, so it's it's day three. This is the final day where the Sinai experience is going to happen. And... There's all kinds of things happening. There's thunder, lightning, heavy cloud. We're going to read about the fire. The the mountains is is lit on smoke. It's also important to note that the Sinai experience is described in three different places in the Torah. It's chapter 20 of, or 19 and 20 of Exodus. It's chapter 24, the end of next week's parasha. And it's also in the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. So we don't get the full story, the full description in either, in any one of those places. We have to kind of cobble them together to get a complete picture. So here we're told that the entire people that was in the camp shuddered. So there's one place called the camp and that was not exactly on, next to the mountain. They had to go from the camp to the mountain. And Rashi tells us that God preempted the Jewish people to the mountain. The the people, they were in the camp and the people in the camp shuddered because of what was happening on the mountain. And this is unusual because the king, so to speak, God arrived at the meeting place before the people. The people should have been there earlier and waited for God, but really was the opposite. God arrived earlier and waited for them. And what happened to the Jewish people? So we're told in the Talmud, they slept in. They knew that the following day was going to be this momentous event at the mountain, but they slept in and they forgot to arrive them and they woke up to all the noise and the terror that was at the mountain. And of course, we have a tradition since then, uh, the night of Shavuos, the night that is the anniversary of that event, we stay up the whole night and study Torah the whole night to kind of atone for the Jewish people sleeping in and having God arrive there before them and having to wait for them, so to speak. So Moses brought the people forth from the camp towards God, and they stood at the ba- at the bottom of the mountain. Mount Sinai was smoking because God had ascended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the entire mountain shuddered exceedingly. And the sounds were getting louder, and then Moses would speak, and God would amplify his voice and to make it uh, that the entire nation could hear about it. So Rashi here tells us, by the way, according from the Talmud in Shabbos, page 88, that when it says the Jewish people stood at the bottom of the mountain, it actually means that they stood under the mountain. Says the Talmud, what does that mean? It means that God took the mountain and turned it upside down over them like a barrel and threatened them. If you accept the Torah, great. If not, I'm going to bury you. And this is an important question. You know, the Jewish people, they signed up for it. They were all in. They wanted the Torah. They they signed off on this whole proposal. They said, we won't even hear the word of God. We don't want to just hear it via Moses. And now God is saying, okay, I know you accepted it willingly, but I want you to also accept it because I compelled you to it. I want you to accept it also under duress. So there's a few answers given to understand what the Jewish people accepted and why that was insufficient. So for example, one of the answers is the Jewish people accepted the written Torah. Now they're accepting the oral Torah. A different answer is that, you know, even though someone signs up for something, unless they have some skin in the game, they're not in it entirely. Jewish people were inspired. But inspiration is not a game plan. Inspiration plus commitment, well, that's a winning strategy. They were inspired to accept the Torah. But now God said, okay, I'm threatening you as well. You're in this 
and you have to be committed because you know if you abandon it, then I'm going to allow the proverbial mountain to crush you. The Talmud in the aforementioned Book of Shabbos, page 88a, adds that this also allowed them to have an escape route. You know, they could say, listen, you know, we accepted this under duress. And therefore, what happens if we don't comply with a deal? We can't be held fully accountable because this was not an agreement that we agreed upon at arm's length. And therefore, we do have a way to kind of finagle our way out of it. In the event where the Jewish people abandoned parts of Torah, they're not going to be destroyed because they could always refer back to this event. God gave us the Torah, but God threatened us to accept it. And therefore, we had no choice and therefore we're not held accountable. Now, this does not allow us to uh, not observe it today because the Talmud goes on to say, well, in the days of Purim, in the times of Ahasuerus, they accepted it willingly, and therefore now we're in willingly, we're in in all kinds of ways. We accepted it under, under duress, but we re-accept it again out of love. So God descends upon Mount Sinai and again summons Moses to the top of the mountain and again warns the Jewish people, warn them, lest they break through to see Hashem and they're all going to die. Even the priests who could get a little closer, they should be prepared because maybe if they get too close, they're all going to die. Moses says, well, I already warned them once before. Why do I need to warn them again? And God says, no, go warn them again. Then you ascend, Aaron ascends, the priests ascend. Each one can ascend to a certain degree, but the people make it very careful that they don't ascend because if they do, then they will die. So Rashi tells us the reason why Moses had to warn them a second time is because that's the way things happen. You warn them ahead of time and then you also reiterate the warning at the time of the actual event to make sure that you're avoiding catastrophe. Alternatively, uh, some have suggested that the Jewish people, they knew that they were going to die if they get too close, but they were willing to die anyhow because the allure of the spiritual ecstasy that they maybe would have thought they would have gotten had they come close would have been something that they're willing to do, even if it means that they die. And therefore, what God is warning them, tell them to not get close. Because if they do get close, they're going to die in vain because they won't actually get to experience what they think that they will experience if they get too close. Some people may be making this calculation, hey, you know what? I'm willing to die just to get close to God, but don't do it because you won't get what you want. You're just going to get the negative results. So after Moses indeed goes and tells the Jewish people and warns them about it, we begin chapter 20 and God starts speaking the Ten Commandments to the Jewish people. God spoke all these statements saying, I am Hashem your God. This is the first of the Ten Commandments. I took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Don't have any other gods before me, don't make yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the water beneath the earth. Don't bow down to them. Don't worship them. If you do, I'm going to visit the sins of the fathers upon the children for three and four generations, but I'm going to show kindness for thousands of generations to those who love me and observe my commandments. Rashi here tells us, that God really said things in ways that we can't even fathom. He said all these things in one word. In one word, he condensed all of the Ten Commandments, and then he repeated it again in a way that is understood to us. And the idea behind this is that in God's eyes, there's really only one commandment. In our eyes, there's 613. But really, those 613 commandments are all various elements of the single commandment to believe in God, all commandments stem from faith. Now, it's important to stress here that the Jewish definition of God is not just the existence of an entity that created the world, but is, I am the Lord your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. It's a description of God who extracted us from Egypt. So not only someone who has all the power, but someone who is aware of what's happening, who's supervising us and is involved in an intimate way with taking a nation 
out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. An entity that has all the power, but is also involved in the lives of humans. And the flip side of that is, the flip side of believing in God is not believing in any other idols. And in fact, when we describe the Ten Commandments, it's important to stress that these are not actually ten mitzvot. There's many more. In fact, the Rambam, when he lists his list of mitzvot in the second of the Ten Commandments, not to have any other gods, he lists four separate mitzvot. Number one, not to believe in foreign gods. Number two, not to construct, not to make foreign gods. Number three, not to worship. And number four, not to prostrate, not to bow down or to genuflect to any foreign gods. Now, the Talmud tells us that the first two of the Ten Commandments were actually given to the Jewish people directly by God. And as we'll see later on, that this was too much for them to handle. The whole nation was really not primed to experience prophecy as much as they wanted to hear the prophecy. According to the Talmud, they actually died. They had to be resuscitated and they died again. But the first two of the Ten Commandments were given to us directly by God. Whereas the rest of them, the other eight, were given to us via Moses. God spoke to Moses. Moses told us those other eight. And the reason why we had to get the first two directly from God, because they really encapsulate all of Torah. All of Torah is included in the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. Every positive mitzvah, every time God says, do something, and we listen, we are invoking the fact that we believe in God. Every time God says, don't do something, and we refrain, we withhold from doing what God does not want us to do, that is a fulfillment of not having any other power that supersedes God. And if we, God forbid, were to transgress a negative prohibition, then in effect, we're repudiating our faith because we're saying that this other action that God says, no, we do it anyhow. Well, that demonstrates that there are some other ideals, some other priorities, some other values that supersede God. In effect, every transgression has a certain degree of idolatry to it. Now, it's interesting that if you look a little bit later on in this chapter, it's clear the Jewish people went to Moses and said, this is too much for us to handle. We can't manage. You speak to us, not God. Rashi, in quoting from the Talmud, tells us that the first two were directly from God and the last eight were not. If you look at the text of the first two, it's clear that God is speaking directly to the Jewish people. I and the Lord of God who took you out of the land of Egypt. You should not have any other foreign gods before me, etc. Whereas if you move on to, let's say, verse 7, which is the third of the Ten Commandments, you should not take the name of God in vain. It doesn't say you should, you should not take my name in vain, because at this point, it's God speaking to the Jewish people through Moses. So the third of the Ten Commandments is to not take God's name in vain. Number four is the Shabbos, to remember the Shabbos, to sanctify the Shabbos, to work for six days, do what we need to do. But when Shabbos comes around, we do no work. Not only us, our children, our sons, our daughters, our servants, our animals, the convert, everyone takes a day off. It's a day of rest. It's a day of cessation of creativity. Just like God for six days created the heaven and earth and the seventh day ceased to work and therefore he sanctified and blessed the Shabbos, so too we should follow suit. When Shabbos comes, I work as if, as if it's done. In fact, that's the reason why we don't make any personal requests in our Shabbos prayer. You have to honor your father and mother so that your days will be lengthened upon the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. So this is interesting. This is a commandment to honor your father and mother. And we're also told that there's a certain kickback that we get. If we do that, our days will be lengthened, we'll have a long life. If we don't do that, then our days will be shortened. The commentaries tell us that this is actually tit for tat. You know, if someone were to find an abandoned baby on the street and take it to their home and give them clothing and food and drink and worry for all their needs... Certainly, that child would grow up with a great appreciation for their adoptive parents. Well, what happens with someone's biological parents? They brought them into the world. They're their biological pedigree. They did all kinds of good things for them. If someone does not appreciate that, what they're in effect saying is they don't appreciate life. 
well, you know what? If you don't appreciate life, you're in effect telling God, I don't like life. And therefore, it's fitting that your life will be shortened if you don't appreciate what your parents have done for you. The Talmud points out that there are two separate mitzvot that were told that if you do them, if you obey them, your life will be lengthened. Number one, honoring your father and mother. Number two, to send away the mother bird before you take the babies. That's a mitzvah we will meet in Deuteronomy. Says the Talmud, we're told by the most severe mitzvah, the mitzvah of honoring your parents, and we're told by the most lenient mitzvah, the mitzvah of sending away the money mother bird, that you'll have a long life. Well, that's in effect telling you that all the mitzvahs spanning the spectrum from the most severe to the most lenient, all of them lead to long life, and long life not just in this world, but also in the eternal world. And then we read from 6 through 10, not to kill, not to commit adultery, not to steal, not to be a false witness, and finally, not to covet all the good things that your fellow has, that your neighbor has, not his wife, not his servants, not his ox, not his donkey, nothing that he has. And we would be remiss if we didn't mention the Ibn Ezra's famous statement on the mitzvah of not to covet. This seems like it's a mitzvah that's not fulfillable. The mitzvah is not to not act upon your desires. Rather, it's to not have the desires in the first place. To not even covet what your neighbor has. Says the Ibn Ezra, what that means is that a person has to believe in God to such a degree where the actions of God, the decisions of God, actually affect the way he sees the world. And therefore, if God decided that your neighbor has a beautiful wife, or ox, or donkey, or servant, you have to realize that that was apportioned to him by God. It's his, it's his, and it's not yours, and there's nothing you could do to change that. And therefore, you shouldn't even covet it. And the Ibn Ezra tells us that just like someone, someone who at least who is, who is well balanced mentally does not covet to grow wings out of their forearms to fly like a bird, even though of course that would be super cool, but it's totally infeasible, totally inaccessible. It's totally unrealistic and therefore you don't covet it. Similarly, you should have the same degree of conviction that it is unrealistic for you to take what God decided belongs to your neighbor. Now, the Ten Commandments, of course, these are fundamental pillars of our religion. And the reason why they're so significant, we already said earlier, according to the Rambam, it's because they proved the veracity of Moshe's credentials as a prophet. Rashi tells us that actually they contain an encapsulation of all of Torah. And he quotes uh, the Sa'ad Yergon, who tells us that all 613 mitzvos are included into these 10 categories. Uh, the Midrash also tells us that if you count the letters in the Ten Commandments, there's 620 letter, letters in total, corresponding to 613 mitzvos plus the seven Noahide mitzvos. We're also told a little bit later on that eventually these Ten Commandments are going to be delivered to the Jewish people on two stone tablets. On the first tablet, it's going to say the first five. And on the second tablet, it's going to say the final five. Why do we have two separate tablets and not just one? Or maybe each one of the Ten Commandments should be in its own tablet. So the commentaries explain something very interesting. It says that we could read the Ten Commandments either vertically or horizontally, meaning that you could read one with six, two with seven, three with eight, four with nine, and five with ten, because there is a connection between the first tablet and the corresponding commandment in the second tablet. So for example, the first and the sixth, what do we read in the first one? We read about, I'm the Lord your God. Man is created in the image of God. And therefore, someone who murders is also attacking the image of God. What's the second commandment? Not to have any false gods. Well, our relationship that we have with God 
is similar to a marriage. And if we repudiate our relationship with God, it's similar to someone being unfaithful to their spouse and committing adultery. Those two are parallels. Someone who steals, which is number eight, is someone who is likely to swear falsely, which is number three. Four and nine, Shabbos has to do with testifying that God created the world in six days and ceased to create on day seven. And someone who does not believe that is someone who testifies falsely. And finally, five and ten, they're all about entitlement. We're told a number five, to appreciate what our parents did for us and never to honor them. And someone who does not believe that or someone who is the opposite of that is someone who feels entitled and they covet the things that belong to others. So the entire people saw the thunder and the flames and the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain. The people were trembling. They stood from afar. Rashi tells us they were blown away, so to speak, 12 mil to like 12 miles away. And they tell Moses, you speak to us. We don't want God to speak to us. If otherwise, we will die. And now it's also important to note that it says that the people saw the thunder and the flames. They didn't hear them. They saw them. The relationship that we have with what we hear is much less potent than what we see. The people experience the prophecy and the spirituality on such an intimate sensory level. It's considered as if they saw the sounds. They experienced it in the most deep fundamental way. They were blown away. And Rashi quotes from the Talmud that the angels brought them back. They're terrified. They come to Moses. You speak to us. We're terrified. We can't handle this. That's Moses' response. No, don't be scared. God wants to test us. And he wants us to be elevated. And we, he wants us to not sin. And that's why we're having this momentous experience. And the people stood from afar as Moses approached the thick cloud. Rashi and the Rabbani agree exactly when that was. And finally, Hashem tells Moses, so shall you tell the children of Israel. So this is after the Sinai experience. Right afterwards, Mo, the Parsha is going to end with three separate commandments. Tell the Jewish people, number one, not make images of gold and silver, which are idolatrous. So that's the first thing. Rashi explains what that means is, is that God is going to command us very soon to build an ark. On top of the ark, there's going to be cherubs. The cherubs have to be of gold, not of silver. They have to be two, not four. And if they don't comply, it's just it's considered as if it's idolatry. That's number one. Number two, don't use metal to cut the stone of the altars. If you build a, a an altar of stone, you cannot use metal to cut it. And finally, when you build an altar, don't have steps in it. Instead, you have a ramp so that your nakedness will not be uncovered. So the commentaries tell us that we know there's three cardinal sins, murder, adultery, and idolatry. And here, right after the Sinai experience, we're given three mitzvos that have something to do in a very subtle way, in a very nuanced way, with those three prohibitions. Against the prohibition of idolatry is the prohibition of not to make the cherubs of silver and not to make them four meaning that these cherubs were the instruction of God. And deviating from it in the slightest way is already a remnant, a scintilla of idolatry. Number two, murder. Well, what do you use to murder? Use metal. Distance metal from God to such a degree that you don't even use metal to cut the stones and distance any sort of sexual deviance from God by not making steps in a way that someone who climbs over the steps will have part of their undergarments seen, so to speak, distance that and make it ramp, not steps. And one last thing to point out before we conclude the Parsha is that the verse here, uh, verse 21, God tells Moses, tell the Jewish people that you should make me an altar of earth where you bring sacrifices and wherever you mention my name, I will come to you and bless you. The Sephorno tells us that at this point in time, the Jewish people just had Sinai. There's no golden calf. There's no sin yet. Wherever they invoke God, God will be there. They had a level of closeness with God that they don't need a temple. 
They don't need a tabernacle. The, God is not going to be isolated to one location. Wherever they call out for God, God is going to be there. Once the events that are going to follow, 40 days after the Sinai experience, there's going to be the golden calf. The golden calf is going to necessitate the tabernacle because thenceforth, from that point forward, God's presence as a place where he's going to accept our sacrifices is going to be limited to the tabernacle sacrifices that are going to be offered outside of that location are not going to invoke that presence of God. Next week, we're going to, again, depart from the chronology and listen in on many of the commandments of the actual Torah itself and culminating at the end with the narrative revisiting what actually happened at Sinai and giving us more descriptions of that most momentous and significant event.